but I wanted to talk about three groups of uh, people tonight. Sons of Issachar, right? Watchmen on the wall, and the Bereans. And it's been interesting over the past couple weeks, I've either heard mention, well, at least two of these groups of, of, of people from this pulpit. I think Anthony mentioned um, one and Pastor Rip mentioned the other. And then I was just humming a song the other day and, you know, he makes mention of the Lord, be silent, do not be silent, right? You know, watchman on the wall. See, I don't sing. That's, that's why I'm in the background. But anyway, so I'm like, oh yeah, the watchman on the walls. And what does that mean for us today? So let's, I just want to quickly go through these three groups and then let's talk about what kind of, you know, application we can have for us today, okay? Sons of Issachar. How many times do you think sons of Issachar are really mentioned uh, in the word? Right? I mean, they're, they're mentioned a number of times. They're, you know, you only really see them when it talks about the genealogies or a census is being taken, right? Um, but the, and, and they joined Deborah and Barak to feed Jabin, right? That's mentioned in Judges chapter 5. Um, and we, ha- we know we have a judge that came from uh, the tribe of Issachar and a couple of kings. They were in the northern, the tribe of uh, Issachar was in the northern kingdom. And, um, and then they're also mentioned uh, in Revelation chapter 7, right? Along with 144,000, you know, is Jews that are become super energized Billy Grahams, right? Evangelists. Um, but... They, what they really are known for is the reference in First Chronicles chapter 12. So let's just bop over there real quick. Yeah, I've got to go this way. I even have a bookmark right there. <laughs> After all that, First Chronicles chapter 12. So, uh, so what, what's, what's happening here is uh, chapter 11 of First Chronicles, uh, David is made king, right? And then in chapter 12, uh, the army of Israel is, is gathered. The people are gathered together to basically say, yep, we are standing with you, you know, David, right? And, uh, and it's a very turbulent time. There's a lot of uh, uh, discussion. Well, should King be, or, I mean, should David be the king? Uh, shouldn't we try to find a, a relative, you know, of, of Saul uh, from the tribe of Benjamin? And there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty. And then when we come to verse 32 of chapter 12, and it says, And the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And then it says their chiefs were 200 and goes on to tell us that their numbers. But that one little, you know, half verse right there, they had the understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And, and when we um, see other references to the sons of Issachar, uh, we, we account to them that they had really, you know, great discernment to see, okay, this is, this is where we are. And it's not just where we are, you know, according to the word, but geopolitically as well. This is what's going on around us. These are our options. And, you know, should we go with David or should we uh, try to find, you know, a replacement for Saul from, from the tribe of Benjamin? Discernment. God's wisdom and God's discernment. And I can't remember who said it um, in the last week or so, but um, whoever was in the pulpit also mentioned that discernment is a huge need in the church today. Would you not agree? I mean, it is so hard to, to see and understand, okay, to, and to discern, okay, is this, is this fellow or this, this gal that's a spokesperson, are, are they true for truth or are they against truth, right? Um, and, you know, 
just because they have a great huge band or, you know, doesn't mean that their ministry is, is wonderful, right? I mean, uh, smoke, lasers, light shows. Um, I, I was reading an article uh, on a discussion that, you know, the ch- well, just in society today, especially in the Western world, uh, man really wants to, ex- you know, they really want to excite that dopamine, right, sensation in your brain. And so everything has to smell right and look right and be fun. And TV shows are engineered and designed to just excite that, that in you, right? Our kids, I mean, our kids can't even you know, really go outside and, and know how to play with a stick and a rock anymore, can't, right? That used to entertain some of us for hours, right, when we were young. And today now, if it doesn't, you know, flash and make a bazillion noises if they touch it, um, Kids don't want to have anything, anything to do with it because it excites that, that gives you that dopamine high, right? Well, it, it's crept into the church as well. You know, we go to elevation worship, they've got fog. They even emit a, a smell into the auditorium. You know, so they got you on the, all the sensory, you know, inputs to excite you. 45 minutes or an hour or whatever, you know, so you come back next week. And uh, that's not what we're here. That's not the reason we go to church for, is it? Um, Discernment. So, like I said, sons of Issachar, they had an understanding uh, and what should Israel do? Uh, Watchmen. Let's talk about watchmen. Let's go to Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62, let's see, where are we here? Um, title for, in my Bible for chapter 62 is the assurance of Zion's salvation, all right? Um, let's jump to verse six. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. And he and give him no rest till he establishes and until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And I'll we'll just stop there. Um, you know, watchmen. Um, this Hebrew word is used, I thought I, I thought I wrote it down, but, you know, close to 300 times um, in the Old Testament. Um, the same word is used in Genesis 2.15. Uh, then the Lord, uh, God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And he, uh, Genesis 3.24, so he drove out the man, so we put him in, well, now he's driving out the man, and he placed cherubim at the um, east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard, same word, guard, the way to the tree of life. Genesis 4, verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Same word. All right. Keep. Beware, take heed, observe, circumspect, to wait on. This is the same word um, in, in the Old Testament that is used here in Isaiah 62. Okay. Um, Deuteronomy 4, 9. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself. It's used twice. Same word is used twice. Take heed and to keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. That's a, that's a huge admonition, right? Um, that was Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. Now, interestingly, there is another Hebrew word that is translated in English to watchman, 
And we find that in Ezekiel chapter 3. And so let's just jump over there. Okay. Starting, uh, let's see, verse 16 of Ezekiel 3. Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet, verse 19, if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn away from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul." So, what have we learned just from this quick uh, few verses here about what watchmen are supposed to do, right? What I, what I really like is watchmen are not to keep silent, right? And even though it was a different Hebrew word, when we read in Ezekiel chapter 3, God is, is saying to Ezekiel, you know, Ezekiel, when you hear of, of these dangers, these warnings, that I'm giving the people. If, if you keep your mouth closed and they go to hell, their blood is on you. I mean, that's how, how much God wants us to share, all right? So, not to keep silent. They guard, they keep. You know, you think of, uh, you know, the watchmen on the walls, and if you, if you remember, you know, the account of when Israel returned back to Jerusalem after their Babylonian captivity, and they had to rebuild the wall, right? And every man had his house right by the wall, and he kept his sword, you know, off to the side while he's building, and he's ready to defend, to keep watch over that part of the wall so that the enemies uh, that were uh, there... Could not, could not tear down the wall or, nor, nor attack them. They are to keep guard. Well, God has given us that same responsibility. I mean, we don't have a, I don't have a physical wall around my house, right? But spiritually, I'm in charge of making sure that that hedge is around my home, that hedge of protection that, that, that uh, comes from the word of God. Um, when we are together as a group, you know, we have that same responsibility for one another. If you see one of your brothers or sisters kind of going off where they're not supposed to, right? You need to help be that guard. Hey, you know, stray in, you're straying, get back. Come on, get back where it's safe, right? And we were talking, uh, Pastor Ritt was talking about sheep uh, the past few Sundays. And, uh, you know, what, what does the wolf want to do? He wants to go after that one sheep, right, that has wander it off. In fact, Pastor even mentioned on Sunday that, you know, you have a, a rebellious sheep that just wants to, uh, you know, go off to the, you know, where they shouldn't go. And what do the other sheep do? They follow it, right? Um, so watchmen, they are to guard, they are to keep, they are to be circumspect. What does circumspect mean? Head on a swivel. You know, take a look. Well, what's going on around me, right? Another word is prudent as well. You know, uh, consider all the circumstances. Like the sons of Issachar. I think you could say they were circumspect, right? They had their head on a swivel. They, they kind of knew what was going on around them. And a watchman is to look out in God's prophetic future, right? And this was kind of the charge for, uh, to, to Ezekiel. And to proclaim it. You know, if you truly believe that we are at the end of the church age and the great tribulation is just around the corner, what's going to happen to this lost and dying world? Perish, right? They're going to hell. 
if you know that and you are not proclaiming that because you know the future. God has given you, you know, this, the ability through his Holy Spirit to read and to understand his word. And then in those areas that, wow, it might be a little bit harder to understand, as, as, as our pastor has said many times, we have giants whose shoulders we can stand on so we can see further out, right? We have so much knowledge of the word of God today than was around 100 years ago even. Uh, we should use it. All right, so that's, that's watchmen. Third one, the Bereans. Let's turn to Acts 17. Verse 10. Now, the Bereans were from Berea. Berea. Thank you. <laughs> Which I think is, uh, if I remember correctly, is because uh, everybody knows where Thessalonica is, right? So it was about 50, 60 miles southwest of uh, Thessalonica, not northwest uh, of Greenville. This is a different Berea. Um, Acts chapter 17, verse 10. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Why? What was going on? The Thessalonians did not like Paul and Silas. They sought to kill them, right? So let's send them out, let's send them somewhere else. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue, into the synagogue of the Jews, because that's what Paul did. He arrived in a new place. The first place he went was to church to the house of God, to the synagogue. And what was he doing there? Sure. Teaching, sharing, right? Getting a sense as to, okay, what is God doing here? You know, who's, who's kind of open, you know, just getting a quick lay of the land, right? Verse 11, these were um, more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And that's what we always hear about the Bereans, right? They searched the scriptures daily to find out if what they heard is true. We are to be good Bereans, right? Um, you hear a teaching and you're like, I've never heard that before. You, know, you don't just kind of go, okay, well, gee, I wonder what that's about, and you just go off in your merry way. No, what are you supposed to do? You're in your Bible every day anyway, right? Yeah. Right? So you sit down, and now you may have to take a note because, you know, you get to a certain age, and the next day comes along, and you're like, what was I supposed to look up? I can't, you know, so, so after you've made a note, and you sit down, and, and, and you kind of, you know, you open up the word yourself. Okay, what was this person sharing? What did Darren say Wednesday night? And I got to go check it out to make sure what he said was true. That's what you should be thinking in the back of your head, right? Um, I mean, some of you have known me for many, many years, and some of you have never even met me yet, all right? You don't know who this guy is. Who is this guy? You know? But, you know... I don't know about you, but there's probably within a, in a week's period of time, there's probably five or six other, you know, Bible teachers I've listened to something to on the internet or read something that, that they've posted, right? And many of them, you know who they are. Some of them, you're like, man, who is this? Even preparing for tonight, you know, uh, you're Googling around for some information and it takes you to a website and you're like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. But who is this website? You know, who made it? You know, oh, it was done by the Mormons, or it was done by the, you know, this or that. You need to kind of understand where are these people, you know, where is this teacher coming from? And, uh, and then check it out. Um, so they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Verse 12, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women, as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. 
Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted um, Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command from Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Okay. So, all right, what do we see about the, the Bereans? They were willing to receive the word of God, and they were eager, because that word was used, eager to hear the teaching of Paul and Silas. Are you eager to hear the word of God taught? I don't know about you. I mean, we could ask Ed and Carolyn. How many times have you ever heard the book of John taught? Yet you lost count, right? You know, but when you sit here on Sunday mornings and you hear Pastor Ritt teach, is there not something that you go, oh, wow, I've never seen it that way. Or, oh, I didn't think about that, right? You know, there's like this... A, a new revelation or a light bulb kind of goes on. And, and that's, you know, partly because you're not in the same place in life where you were in the last time you heard somebody teach or you read it, right? Um, they, um, they examined what they heard and compared it to the Old Testament scriptures. Of course, you know, we, also, we have the benefit today of comparing to, to Old and New Testament um, scriptures. They guarded Paul's safety. We're told that in verses 13 and 14. Uh, they continued to grow in their faith because Silas and Timothy remained behind and, and grew the church there. Uh, we know that. Uh, they supported Paul in his missionary work as well. Uh, in Acts 20 later on, um, there's a man from Berea that accompanied um, Paul on his missionary trip um, to Asia. All right? Um, so we know the Bereans, good model to follow after, right? Um, they continue today to be held up as a positive example as how a person is to respond to, to biblical teaching. You know, as students, we're supposed to be eager. We're to really, you know, dig in into the word and see, you know, if it's true or not, right? Um, so, you know, we need to model their, their spiritual maturity um, even, even today. All right. So these three different groups, wow, time goes by quick up here. I think there's like a, Bermuda trial, Triangle thing up here where time just like slips away. Um, so three different groups, some similarities, right? Some differences, but can you re relate to, to these, these three groups? Um, so, all right, that's great, Darren, but so <laughs> what does it mean, right? So how can we apply this uh, for today, right? Um, well, it's, it's obvious that we're supposed to continue, you know, in the study of, of God's word and we are to know what the truth is and to really dig out those nuggets, right? Um, so we're to also know what's going on around us. Uh, there, there's some churches that say, well, you know what, you just, you know, blinders on, don't ignore the world, God's in control and just... You know, just read your Bible and don't don't participate in voting, right? Don't you know? Don't get involved in the in the things of the world. Um, but you know, do you think the sons of Issachar kind of kept blinders on? You know, I, I think you know we have people that are out there that um, really are, are newsies. They really know what's going on, right? But they're not Christian. We have the benefit of both worlds where we can kind of see what's going on around us and we can take the word of God and map it out in this timeline that God has given us to see, oh, here we are on God's schedule. Wow, look at that. We're just where God wants us to be. He told us this, you know, centuries ago, sometimes millennia ago that this is going to happen. So they should encourage us to be, to be like, wow, I, I am so glad I, I know the Lord. I'm so glad that I understand what, what, that what God's word says. I'm so excited that he's coming. I am so excited enough that I'm going to go out and share. But this also means, you know, you can't get sucked into everything. It's so easy to get agitated it's so easy to become annoyed, isn't it? If, if you start watching too much of the news, 
and you're not reading enough of this, of the word, you get that agina, you know? There's some crazy things going down, down, um, on down at the abortion mill um, lately. And let's, just, let's just put it, pretty much every day we, there's police officers there. That things uh, that used to be nice and quiet and we can go down and pray and we won't be annoyed um, or, or attacked. And you know, today it's, it's, it's crazy. And when you hear some of the things that they say about you that you know aren't true, you just get rough. Oh, like that's, you know, you get all anxious inside. And that's not what we're, we're supposed to do, right? Also means that we have to um, get our news from reliable sources. So CNN, John, is that where, I, you know, you know? Uh, over the years, Pastor Red and many of us have shared uh, some really reliable news sources. Most of them are not in the country, right? <laughs> you know, there are some good news, news sources uh, in the United States. You just got to find them. But, you know, just have a good repertoire of, of, of news sources, uh, domestic and international. Um, and I know many of you, if not most of you, already have a handle on this. And I know you guys talk to one another, so share, you know, where you're getting your information from and, and, and so on and so forth. Let's see, we are also, and how do we apply this? We need to have discernment. Um, you know, like the sons of Issachar, they had that discernment. You know, if it, sometimes it looks right, it sounds right, but it's rotten to the core. It doesn't pass that smell test, Right? You know, sometimes you just don't really understand that what's wrong. Well, that's the Lord giving you some discernment. And, and you can just say, well, okay, Lord, now show me really, you know, what's wrong, you know, because it doesn't pass that smell test. Um, we are to, you know, be good Bereans. We're to know the scripture for ourselves. Um, Pastor Ritt has shared a ton of information, right? I've been coming to this church since January of 2005. There's some of you here have been coming here any, much longer than I have even. And Pastor Ritt hasn't changed, <laughs> let me tell you. He gives a lot of information out. You know, hour plus Bible studies, you know, and uh, I don't, that's not going to change. All right, and so you just have to come ready to receive that fire hose. But he has a great teaching technique. He likes to repeat himself a lot, right? Because that's how we learn. We need to hear. Darren needs to hear it over and over again. There's some things that he has been saying for, for you know 17 years that I've been listening to him teach, because I need to hear it over and over, and uh, you know. Pastor Ritt didn't get, make up that idea all by himself, you know. He might have got it from Second uh, Peter, you know, Second Peter 1, 12, and 13. Peter says, for this reason, I will not be negligent, neg negligent, thank you, to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in, the, in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, Right? We need to be reminded all the time. Um, let's see. Watchmen. We're to be watchmen. We're to be watchwomen. Well, you are. I'm a watchman. <laughs> Let's keep that, make that clear, okay? <laughs> make it clear. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, real quick, and we've gone through this before, if you've been at this church for any period of time, Matthew 24, right? And read Matthew 24. If you don't have an understanding of Matthew 24, read it, okay? But through Matthew 24, we see that we have religious deception coming. There are wars and rumors of wars, famine, pestilences, earthquakes. Am I reading the front page of the newspaper or something? You know, persecution of followers of Christ, including attacks from within the church. That's verses 9 and 10. 
lawlessness. All right? But we also see that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. And unfortunately, we also see that Jerusalem will be surrounded with armies and enemies. That's all in Matthew 24. And you get an understanding of that, and then you compare that to what is going on in the world today. Watch men, watch women. What, what was one of those words I said that watch men don't do? They don't keep silent, right? Don't, don't be silent. I'll also add this. Don't be silent. And if you have to use words, use words. Does that make sense? Your life, your Christian life, the way that you live your life for the Lord should be so loud to the world, they should know where you, who you are, what you stand, who you represent. And if they don't, well, then you're going to use words and you're going to tell them, right? Because I don't want us to be obnoxious. We're not called to be obnoxious. You know, Jesus said, hey, when sharing the gospel, you know what? If it's not being received, he, he says, don't cast your pearl before swine. Move on. Kick the dust off your feet and, and move on, right? Um, it's not my job to save that person. It's his job. God is, God's sovereignty is my sanity, Right? He, he is sovereign. Uh, just like Ezekiel called to be a prophet, right? Uh, we're to be prophets to our families. Uh, men, especially you, get, you men, uh, leaders in your families, so you're to be those prophets to your family, making sure your family understands the word of God, what is going on, how to apply it to their lives. In love, of course, right? So does all that make sense? You know? Um, now, here's the cool part, is that all through this, and as we're trying to figure out how to walk and to be these watch men and women and be good Bereans, right? Our Lord still wants to have a daily relationship with us. I don't know why God would want to hang out with me. All right. I'm I'm certainly not, you know, a winner. All right. But God, for some reason, in his sovereignty, has decided, well, Darren is going to become a child of God. So here I am. And the Son of God wants to walk with me and, and have fellowship with me, all right? Um and this is where we come to communion because communion is part of the fellowship that we get to have with the Lord. Uh, did you know that the word communion is actually the English word communion is only found in three verses in the New Testament? Kind of shocked me. I was like, what? Four, so used four times. So one verse is communion is used twice. And, uh, and only one of those verses, the one that communion is used twice in, refers to the Lord's Supper. The other two are, hey, have communion with the Holy Spirit, right? It's more of a fellowship word, right? I would probably have used the word fellowship there. Uh, but the word communion kind of has a much uh, deeper connection, you know, than the word fellowship, right? You know, you have fellowship, you go out to lunch, you know, when you... When you have communion, it's kind of like, well, it's a little bit more intimate, right? Um, so I could see how the word communion is used uh, in relationship to the Holy Spirit. Um, but the Greek word that, that is used for communion, is, as we all know, is koinonia, right? And most of the time, uh, koinonia is used, you know, to, to mean fellowship. As I mentioned, only four times is it used, um, translated to the word communion, um, let's go to first Corinthians 10. And this verse I've been talking about is, um, 
uh, verse 16, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. And it's interesting that this verse in 1 Corinthians is in a section of the word that's talking about idolatry. And if you think about it, do we have an idolatry, pro- idolatry problem today? We, we certainly do. Uh, John Michael is, mentions this all the time. We don't know just how compromised we are living in this country. Um, we're fortunate we live in Greenville, South Carolina. It's kind of a bubble, right? But even this bubble is getting tainted. And, uh, and, when, and even as a believer who you know, reads their Bible and, and comes to church regularly, you have been contaminated by the world. And, and you, you don't even know just how much that, that you have been compromised. We, th- we think, okay, well, you know, and this is, a human, this is human nature. We compare ourselves to other people all the time, don't we? Well, I'm not as bad as they are, right? So, okay, well, maybe you're not. Maybe if, you know, if Satan is over here and the Lord is over here, right, and you're unsaved, you know, folks that are more compromised to, than you are in your own opinion, they're, they're over here next, right, to, to the devil. Where, where would you put yourself? Are you over here close to the Lord? No, you're, you're just, just to the right of them in, in this timeline. You're, you're closer, you know, right? You know, just not as close as, as they are, but you're compromised. We are compromised. Be a Berean, <laughs> right? Look it up. Uh, so this warning against idolatry, and I just wanted to quickly, no, I don't want to quickly, it's, it's five of. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, I, let's just jump down to verse, let's go up to verse 7, or because there are some things in here that Paul is like saying, you know, hey, you know what? This is what we're not to be. In verse 7, he says, and, and, and do not become idolaters as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Um, it's talking about, you know, that, that's a reference to uh, Exodus 32, where the golden calf was going on. They sat down and they worshiped the golden calf and and... Right? They were idolaters. Verse 8 says, Nor let us commit sexual or, uh, immorality as some di- of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Um, this is a reference to Numbers 25 with the Baal worship um, at Peor. All right? So look up Numbers 25, verses 1 through 9. And the plague there killed. First, first the, the judgment of the Lord killed about 1,000, and then the plague at the end killed 23,000. You add that all together. That's the 24 that Paul uh, references here in verse 8. Verse 9, nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by serpents. All right? Write down Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. This is where the people spoke against God and against Moses. And so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people died. Um, verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 10, nor complain. Oh, ooh, careful. It's close to home, right? You're not complaining. As some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Uh, right down here, uh, number 16, verses 1 through well, 49. This is all about Korah's rebellion, Remember that story, right? They all came up, the, the, the leaders of Israel, and, and uh, stood up against Moses, right? And God um, killed them. About 14,700, actually. And uh, verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10, Now all these things happened to them as examples. You know, we have a lot of of examples here in the word. This is why it's so important as a believer that you have your head in the word of God continually, continually, because they are examples. Sometimes we have examples of what, what to do and what to be like, 
And we have a lot of examples of what not to do and what not to be like. Unfortunately, as we have learned all the time from history, we don't learn anything from history, right? That was them. Oh man, I'm so much, you know, more mature than they were. I would never do that. So I can go walk, you know, down that same path that they went and, and that was their destruction, but it won't destroy me, will it? Ha, ha you know, fools. We, you know, we can be fools at times. Uh, let's jump down to uh, 1 Corinthians ten sixteen. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go to four. Let's just go back to 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak to um, as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. Okay, Paul's giving you some credit here. You're, he's speaking to you as a wise person, right? Flee from idolatry. Verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we are, um, we are all, for we all, I'm sorry, partake of that one bread. Uh, let's jump down to verse 21. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do you want to provoke the Lord to jealousy? So, we have an idol, idolatry problem today, even in the church in America. Um, but some of my favorite two words put together, but, but God, right? Because we are told in 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Anything you need to be cleansed of today, take it to the Lord. We talk about all the time about how we need to keep these lists short, our list of offenses, the, the list of things that we need to be cleansed from. You keep it short. I, I certainly hope you don't wait for the once a month that we come together for communion to take care of your list and get cleansed. That should be a daily activity uh, sometimes it might need to happen multiple times throughout the day, right? Um, you take it to the Lord. Become clean. Then we can partake. And that's what we're here together tonight. To partake together. To commune, commune with the Lord. And we can have fellowship with one another. Right? Right? Uh, if you're new to the chapel, the way that we do communion is we, we do not pass the elements around. What we do is we'll dim the lights, we'll put some instrumental music on, and we'll enter into a time of prayer for yourself. And when you're ready, you come up and you receive and you take communion. Um, we'll probably do this for 10 15 minutes, depending on, you know, how long it takes, you know, everybody to come up, and then we'll close with a song, okay? All right, let's pray.